go Grizzlies. Um, <laughs> and he has many, many years of experience in luxury fashion. He is also a reenactor um, on the weekends, and he makes a lot of his own clothing that he wears for Civil War reenacting. So he knows the fashion side of it, the construction side of it. Here to share with us the history of men's fashion, my coworker and snazzy dresser, Alex Pinesha. All right. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> or not. There we go. Try that again. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. All right. Um, so, yes, we are today talking about the world of men's fashion, uh, or sometimes lack thereof. Um, <laughs> This is a really big topic. I mean, it obviously, it spans uh, thousands of years in the entire globe uh, and of so many different cultures and subcultures, and it's just too big. So we had to set some parameters before we got going. Um, we're going to focus primarily today on Western men's fashion. There will be a couple of nods here and there to fashion from a little further east as it informs Western fashion. Uh, we're also going to start in about the year 1700 with a little bit of 1600s before that, again, because it's going to inform what the 1700s looks like. And we're going to call it quits right around the end of World War II. I'm also going to stick primarily to uh, more mainstream fashion. As I said, there are dozens and dozens of subcultures and things like that that are going to be um, you know, somewhat, some variety from the norm here, uh, but again, we'd be here for about six days and it would be a life's work to try to catalog all of that. So we're gonna kind of restrict it to those sort of parameters for now. Don't worry, there are a few subculture ones that we're gonna get to as we go. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the idea of dress code. Um, we have kind of our modern dress code that we think of now um, as formal, semi-formal, informal, and then there's of course a long list of a variety of different kinds of casual, which I'm gonna uh, not get into quite as much today. Uh, historically, there's been a few other styles, and we refer to them differently, and they kind of mean different things. So I'm gonna let you guys know on some of these here, 1800s, um, Full dress is more what you would call the word just formal. It's kind of that that's the look there when you're um, appearing before royalty or there is a very elegant evening affair, something like that. That is full dress. Uh, half dress is less commonly seen and used as a phrase, but it's going to be sort of a dressed up version of um, what is called undress. And undress is not what it sounds like. <laughs> um, undress is basically not full dress. It's what you might wear uh, more typically for kind of your everyday wear, whether you're a businessman going into work, something like that, that is actually considered undress uh, through the 1800s. Uh, and again, there are some other slight varieties to those things as you go different times and places. Going further back into the 1700s, we still have full dress. Um, which is not going to even be really a totally separate style. It's just going to be more quality and cut and um, how over the top and opulent it will be. Fashionable undress is going to be more like your half dress. And then undress is, again, more the kind of thing that you would wear casually, shall we say. Uh, the other word you're looking for, for after undress would be naked. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with the inside out today. Um, 18th century undergarments for men um, are going to include shirt, drawers, and stockings. Um, you might think of them as like socks. They're sometimes called hose also. Um, that's really unpleasant. <laughs> Do we have a suspicion of why it's doing that? Do I need to move mics or? No guess? OK. We'll get it figured out as we go. Um, <coughs> hopefully it's not like a gong show, right? Um, so the, the undergarments are not going to change wildly. Um, so we'll start with the shirt, though. So there's this notion that to show your shirt is like <gasps> showing your underwear. Only marginally true. Uh, it is going to be more or less exposed to a greater or lesser extent um, throughout both 18th, 19th, and into the 20th century, um, but it's not by any means considered something you would wear out in public or when you're receiving guests. It's not naked, it's just not quite the same, right? 
Um, stylistically, you're going to have a slash front. There's going to be um, just one or two buttons up at the collar and nothing down the front at all. So it's, there's no placket, there's no buttons on the front, it's just open which I can tell you on a hot day when nobody's looking, you can stick your fingers in there and let a little vent. It's very pleasant. <laughs> um, collar is going to be soft. Starched collars don't come in yet, and the reason for that is that the neckwear of the time is going to bind the collar very close to the neck, and if you had it starched, it would be even more uncomfortable than a starched collar it normally is. Cut of the body and the sleeves are going to be very, very generous. This is a very loose fit, and it allows comfort and movement a little more readily. Uh, around the sleeve, you're going to get this sort of gathered top here, um, and also at the cuff. And the cuffs, kind of an interesting feature with the cuffs, uh, almost without fail, the button on the cuffs is going to be right down where the sleeve meets the cuff. And the reason for that is that so you can flip back your cuff if you're doing sort of a grubby job, if you're uh, maybe writing on a piece of paper and you're likely to get ink, or if you're handling something where your cuffs are likely to be soiled, you flip your cuff back to protect it, and then when you're done with that, you can flip it back forward and it will remain clean. Remember, doing laundry in the 18th and 19th century is like an all-day job. It's a tremendous amount of work, so there are going to be a number of innovations we'll see to help reduce the amount of laundry one has to do. Okay. Underneath, or kind of on the bottoms, I should say, uh, would be drawers. Uh, drawers are not as common in the 18th century as they are in the 19th century, but consider them a little bit like a longer pair of boxers. They're going to help cover um, both your legs from the scratchiness of the wool uh, breeches or trousers you may be wearing, but they're also going to do the job of putting a layer, like the shirt, between your body and its oils and dirt and your outer garments. Most of the outer garments are going to be wool or silk or uh, to a lesser extent during the hot weather mostly uh, linen. So your, uh, those fabrics are very difficult to wash. Both silk and wool uh, don't wash well. Uh, anyone who's ever shrunk in a sweater knows what I'm talking about. Um, so the idea is you wash those as little as possible and you instead will wash your undergarments, which will take the majority of the beating as far as um, your body oils and odors and things go. You would also be wearing stockings, uh, which are going to come from just above the knee all the way down through the toe, of course. Uh, fun side note on uh, materials. Linen is overwhelmingly the popular choice of fabrics for men's shirts in particular, but also uh, for drawers. And the reason for that in part is because there is a thriving linen industry in England at the time. Uh, that's one of their local kind of produced uh, goods. Well, right around the kind of turn of that century there, kind of 1600s into the, the early 1700s, um, India is going to start producing large quantities of inexpensive cotton calico fabrics. It's like a printed fabric. Um, and they're trying to sell those things in England, and it's having a very detrimental effect on the English linen economy. Uh, it's sort of the equivalent of having, say, foreign cars brought into the United States and buying those instead of domestic. You know, your money is going out of the country. So England is actually going to put a ban on imported cotton fabrics. They're called the, uh, the Calico Act. And for a period of about 25 years, they are not importing any outside cotton. And in fact, if you were seen to be wearing imported cotton or other fabrics, you ran the risk of actually being attacked by mobs in the street. So similar to like, you, you see the, the fur is murder kind of movement there, where you're getting like, you know, paint splashed and things like that. It was that kind of a mentality, except it was about uh, linen instead of cotton. Kind of an interesting this little side note in the history there. There's a lot of uh, a lot of fashion is going to be informed by more geopolitical um, kind of uh, goings on than it seems like it would be. We'll see some of those others as we go along. Okay. Now, as far as the actual clothing goes, the uh, three-piece suit kind of gets its origins actually in the mid-1600s. It's an idea that's going to come east and is going to become very popular among. Uh, particularly French and then later English royalty. They're going to start wearing uh, this sort of three-piece uh, outfit, which is going to be breeches, uh, which are like a very short pant that buckles around the knee, a waistcoat, which we might uh, call a vest. They're not actually the same thing, but they have a similar look, uh, and then what's called a justicor or a coat over the top, or a dress coat is also what they're called sometimes. Uh, so those are your three pieces, and that's going to be very much the trend um, going into the 1700s. Um, the beginning of the 17th or 18th century is sort of the height of the Justicor 
extravagance. The, the cuffs have gotten ab abnormally large. You can see here he's got his uh, cuff is turned way, way up. It's actually going to button all the way up around the upper arm here um, and have a very large kind of under, um, kind of under space available there um, and exposing the shirt uh, collar and, and cuffs so you can see those, the ruffles and things on that. Um, they're very long. They're going to come down to about the knee. And then underneath that, you're gonna have a waistcoat uh, that's gonna come up just about to, the, about to the knee. Both are gonna button all the way from the top all the way to the bottom. This gentleman is actually gonna get seen a couple of times because he's showing off more than you normally get to see in paintings from this time. Not that he's by any means scandalous, he's just sitting down so he's, and working, so he's gotten, uh, things are kind of unbuttoned and swept back. So you can see his breeches, you can see his waistcoat, and you can of course still see his coat. Um, some of them are going to become very opulent. Um, they're going to be very, very well decorated with gilt and things like that. Um, you're going to see um, very fancy brocade fabrics and things like that. Silk is very common among the upper class. For a more typical day wear, it's going to be uh, more of a plain wool more typically, but you're going to see some very ornate detailing that's going to go into these coats. They're really quite attractive. Um, this is actually a military uniform, but I wanted to show you this one because one, it shows a really good image of just how far down those things button, and there are dozens of buttons on this coat. Uh, it must have taken an abnormally long time to actually put the buttonholes in. Putting in 12 takes like a couple of hours if you're decent at it, that would have taken all day. Um, it also has the vertical pockets, which you don't see as often, but they are around. Uh, and actually, interestingly, these, uh, the cuff doesn't button up at all, which is kind of unique. Um, around the back, they're going to be very full skirted. These are, look at a glance, to be very similar to a frock coat, which we're going to talk about later, but the, uh, the heavy skirting in the back is going to be one of those differences. There's probably, I kind of guesstimate, about a yard of fabric, probably just between here and over here. Um, and it's just heavily pleated. Uh, you will also notice along the edges here, there are this kind of slightly brighter colored fabric, that's the lining, and it's showing you that there are uh, vents cut from the waist all the way to the bottom, and the purpose for that uh, mostly is for riding. You get on a horse and you need a little bit of drape, because otherwise it's just going to bunch up on you. Um, and as uh, Lorraine, our director here, pointed out, it also helps if you got a poop. <laughs> Probably true. I'm not an expert on that. I don't wear this century. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of layers, incidentally, between yourself and the toilet um, during this time frame. Um, <laughs> this is from a, uh, I forget which monarch it is, but it's one of some member of royalty was getting married, and they actually, this is the coat that he wore at the time. And again, you can see it's, it's silk, it's beautiful embroidery. It probably took the better part of a year just to make the coat and do the embroidery. Uh, and remember, this is all done by hand. This thoroughly predates sewing machines, still by a pretty good margin. Uh, so this is all entirely done by hand. Uh, you can see along in the breeches where they button up along the side. You're going to want to remember that a little bit for later. Um, as we wear on further into the 18th century, things are going to get a little more simple. We're at the height now, kind of mid-18th century is when the Enlightenment period starts, and that's where a lot of our kind of founding fathers start getting their ideas for the New Republic and some of that kind of thing, um, and it's going to be reflected in fashion. And then from that end, it's going to be a little bit more simple, cleaner lines, less extravagance, although there are still plenty of people who are going to be dressing above and beyond all the way through the century with the heavy gilt uh, detail and things like that. But a lot of people are going to transition from all of the heavy embroidery and handwork, which is very time consuming and extremely expensive, I'm sure, to merely uh, fancier fabrics. And then they're going to let the fabric do the work of making you still look very fancy. Um, even further into the century, this is right around kind of the time of the revolution, and you're going to get this very strong cut away, and you're going to start seeing a lot more of the waistcoat and the breeches. This is going to be uh, kind of the beginnings of the changing male silhouette. Um, so like right now, our modern focus for a man is actually on the torso. All of the, the everything that we wear and we do and all that with the tie and all that, the focus is on the torso. Uh, during this time, the focus is actually kind of navel to knee is sort of where you want the eye to be drawn. And we'll see uh, as we go further in, even, that's even more clear. Um, you notice by then, the, uh, by this time, the buttons only go about halfway down. They've stopped even trying to button them up the front because I don't think you'd be able to walk if you did. Um, 
still have very frilly shirts and things like that, but the waistcoats get very much shorter, and we'll see more of those in a little bit. And look at that, we've even got a little bit of a collar peeking up now. My guess is those buttons are not even functional at all. Um, just because why not show historical figures when we can. The other look of the time is what's being shown here by uh, Alexander Hamilton, which is the it's maybe you get one button done and the rest is still open. It's becoming a style. You're also seeing the lapels are starting to show up. Uh, these kind of come and go over the next couple of decades, uh, but obviously we uh, currently lapels are back in. <coughs> Another way you can go when you're in a less dressed up setting, uh, say work or at court, is what's called the banyan. And this is another one that's actually gonna come east from places like Japan and India. There's gonna be influences because the English and the French and the Americans at this time are traveling and trading with these other cultures, and so their fashion is gonna to begin to influence. They're gonna see kimonos and things like that, and they're gonna start bringing those ideas into their own fashion. So this basically is a bathrobe, uh, but it's acceptable for wear around the home if you're receiving guests and things like that. At the end of the 18th century is my absolute least favorite thing that I probably have encountered throughout this process which I'm calling the belly coat. That's not what it's called, but that's what it looks like. It's a tailcoat, and it's um, basically they, they decided they want to be able to button the front across, but they still want the swept away tail end of the coat. And how do you do that? Well, you sort of just button up here and then chop everything else off. It's not my favorite. And it gets worse. <laughs> I've got another one later that's the absolute worst of the bunch, but I saved that for my, uh, my favorite flops, which is one of our last slides. Um, it's still not better. <laughs> but you get an idea of how men are dressing at the end of the 18th century, and we even get kind of the origins of the top hat here are starting to pop up. Now, as far as the bottoms go, uh, back to this guy. So he's showing his breeches here. Let's take a closer look at those. Um, they button up close to the knee, just, you know, always at this time, always under the knee. I've never seen any that go over. Uh, they've seen the button under the knee, and they're often um, closed up at the very end here with a buckle. You can just barely see his buckle right here. That's going to do the job of holding not only the breeches close to the leg, but it's also going to keep your socks up. Because there's no elastic. Um, so there's going to be probably a knit silk stockings or knit cotton if they absolutely have to be, sometimes wool. Um, but typically it's going to be silk as much as possible. And silk has got a little stretch, but it's not going to have that tensile quality, that elasticity that it needs. Um, so you need to actually tie them up. Garters are one option. Uh, buckles on your breeches are another. They have a fall front, which is uh, the style here. They're going to button similarly to a modern trousers. Uh, but then you also get this sort of flap on the front. These ends here will button up to those two buttons. Uh, so you have actually two sets of buttons kind of running down this, um, uh, on the front of your legs. Um, so nice close-up shot here of the buttoning. It usually seems to be four or five buttons in a buckle. It seems to be the most common, although there are exceptions to that. And we get diaper butt, which is going to be the trend for like the next 200 years. <laughs> Again. Wool and silk really don't stretch that well, and when you need to bend over, you need to have a little give. Uh, wool does give, but as it's stretching, it's also stretching apart. Um, I've seen guys who wear their trousers, uh, for reenacting purposes, they wear their trousers a little too long, and so the crotch of the trousers is actually down mid-thigh range, and it wears out, I know. It, it's because they're wearing their trousers at their modern waist, which is around the hip, instead of the natural waist, which is at the navel, which is the way that it's worn most of the way through history. The kind of low-rise trousers are a much newer uh, invention. Um, so you need, to, you need to build a little bit of room in so that there's give. Otherwise, you end up pulling those seams apart, and they really, it doesn't take that long. Onto the waistcoats more specifically. Two styles of waistcoats, um, some of them have sleeves, some of them do not. They seem to be mostly without by the end of the century and sort of a mixed bag in the beginning. Um, they start quite long, almost as long as the Justicor, the coat, um, and then they shorten up pretty quickly. They are also often very well detailed and decorated, uh, and you see this more and more as coats are being worn open, especially as they start being cut further back. Uh, this gentleman is more getting, again, closer to the, the second half of the 18th century, and he's not only showing the sh nice uh, kind of shortened up um, 
waistcoat. There's also, you can see, no buttons or button holes down on this portion. Again, they're no longer even trying to button it. Why bother putting the buttons there if you're not going to use them? Buttons are expensive. So they're going to leave those off entirely, unlike this coat here, which does still have buttons, and it's probably kind of hard to see from back there. Um, the other thing that's important about what he's wearing is that he's reflecting, again, that sort of enlightenment change where people are starting to move away from the aristocracy and the monarchy uh, and the just ridiculously over-the-top fashions that they're exhibiting, and they're starting to dress more like a country gentleman. Uh, it's becoming more the um, sort of the, the lower upper class um, direction is they're going to start moving that way and moving away from, as I said, the, the completely over-the-top fashions of the upper class. Um, that being said, oops, there we go, there are still people who are going to dress to the nines all the way through the century. Accessories, they make the man. A couple of options here. So swords are still worn throughout this time. That's one of the reasons you have those long vents in the back of the coat. Not only does it make room for your horse or for uh, nature's call, but it also leaves room for your sword to poke out the back so that it's not just making your coat stick up funny in the back. Um, probably in a very limited capacity, men are still wearing their uh, sword on a long, oops, from this side, um, on a long, like a belt that goes across the body and is worn under the coat but over the vest or the uh, waistcoat. Um, that's mostly a 18th or 17th century notion. By the 18th century, they're mostly wearing them on a belt around their hip. Uh, you will see uh, sashes, though, still worn, which is meant to be kind of reminiscent of that sword belt. Uh, if you're trying to get an image of those sword belts, think pirate movies, you know. Big, big belt right across here, big old buckle, that, that was the look. So the sword is going to fall quickly out of fashion throughout the 18th century, but as we go in, it is still fairly popular. Um, it holds on a little bit for military men. Shoes. <laughs> Tis the age of the high heel for men. So this comes east from the Middle East. There's a lot of, um, in the Persian armies, there is a tendency to actually hook your, uh, have these heels so you can hook your feet into the stirrups and stand up and draw your bow and fire because they have mounted archers and that's a popular uh, fighting style at this time. The heel gives you a place to hook and balance, um, which is why you still see on cowboy boots and things like that, it's a place to sort of lock your feet into the stirrups. Um, it starts as a pretty small heel, a very sensible and you know, utilitarian heel, but uh, the upper class are always trying to overdo what the lower classes can to remind them that they are the lower class. So with, uh, during this time, mostly the upper class and lower class are dressing similarly in theory. It's a matter of the details that are going to separate both what is very fashionable and very kind of full dress and then what is considered kind of more casual. They will look very much the same except the full dress will be much dressier looking, um, and the same is true of the lower classes. As much as possible, they're going to keep trying to wear those same styles because, uh, you know, the, the wealthy ones are typically setting the fashion and the lower class want to make themselves look like the wealthy. You're always trying to dress above your station as much as possible. With that comes high heels. Uh, the rich are going to wear them very high. Um, one of the French monarchs at this time was actually known for having battle scenes painted on his heels, which sounds pretty cool. I couldn't find any images of those. Um, red is a very common heel. And it is a pretty attractive look. Um, not one that I'd go for, but it does look nice. Also, very fancy buckles are popular among the upper class. If you're a little more of a simple man, stainless steel is more common. There's also silver and some other options available. Um, pretty quickly, by the time we get into the 18th century, the heel is on its way out. Um, fashion tends to sort of get more and more and more and more, then somebody goes, oh, okay, that's just too much now. And it goes the other way. And that's what happens with the heels. They go up, 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 gone. And we're into the style that'll take us most of the way through the 18th century. It's sort of a very low cut and almost, almost looks more like a slipper um, than it does a more traditional shoe. Also popular among especially those who are trying to look as if they are country gentlemen or those who actually are and are out riding regularly, the tall riding boots, breeches will tuck into those. Wigs. Tis the age of wigs still also. Starts again in the, six, uh, the 1600s and then supposedly, I'm not, don't quote me on it, this is what some sources will say that a lot of the aristocracy at the time had syphilis and apparently syphilis makes your hair fall out, so they started wearing wigs to cover it, and everybody else followed suit. That's what I read. Anyway, um, wigs, again, like all fashion, gets bigger, bigger, bigger. Oh, okay, that's just too much now. This is pretty much the height of the wig style. 
Um, so all three gentlemen here are wearing fairly large and gotta be heavy, hot, and cumbersome wigs. Um, once it hits about this point, you're gonna see people start tying them back, and I've got some images of that a little later, just for um, connections here. We got, we got the high heel with the red sole on, or the red heel rather, on these two gentlemen here. We've got the sash, which sword belt is gone, but sash on these two gentlemen is reminiscent of that. And actually this young gentleman also, yes, that is a young boy, not a young girl. Dresses were very common among um, children at the time because it's really easy to change a nappy that way. Uh, you're not trying to get trousers off, you're just lift up the skirt, change the diaper, and you're back to work. Um, also, his, his hat here is kind of reminiscent of uh, a knight's helmet with the plume on the top and the visor lifted up. So this all that leads me to think that this is probably actually a young gentleman here. Um, but again, you've got the huge cuffs, all the fancy ornamentation, things like that, and enormous wigs. Um, as we move along, the wigs do get bigger. We're gonna come back to this image later. I will explain it, I promise. Uh, typically, once we hit the 18th century, wigs are a little smaller, they are powdered. Um, it's usually a mixture of chalk, starch, and then they are sometimes scented with orange or uh, lilac and a few other things. Um, they believe that this, the chalk and the starch helps to keep uh, lice away. It probably doesn't. Um, <laughs> but it also gives you a look of a more mature, wise gentleman as opposed to some young, dark-haired punk. Um, interesting, you'll see a few other images of people, you know, uh, dusting wigs and whatnot, and the barber, or whatever you want to call them in, the, the, his butler here, they frequently have combs tucked into their wigs and scissors sticking out of their pockets. I think it's to let everyone know that that's their job, that it's not some random guy on the street throwing powder at someone. Uh, gentlemen will often have a variety of different styles of masks that will cover your face while you're being powdered so that you don't powder your face, because chalk and starch would dry your face out something awful. So this guy is wearing what's called a solitaire. This is once we hit that point where everyone goes, all right, the wigs are too big, I gotta do something with this hair, it's in the way. They'll start tying it back, and then they're actually gonna put it in a small black bag, it's usually a black bag, that has ties on the bag, which are then gonna be cinched up and tied around the front, loop back and be tied into a bow in the rear. So your wig is actually tied around your neck, which probably helps keep it in place, and it also um, helps keep it just a little bit more contained. I know. Um, notice, notice again the, just how ridiculously ornate his coat is. Uh, again, probably a year of work trying to do all of that embroidery. All right, now something that we didn't actually comment on as we went by, but you'll notice a number of the gentlemen in these images have a hat tucked under their arm. And it doesn't really look like a hat right now because it's all scrunched up. Uh, so this guy's got it, this guy's got it, and a few of the other ones that we saw go by had it also. Wigs have gotten too large to actually wear a lot of the time. Um, when your head is just so fluffy, the hat doesn't stay. Or it smushes down your wig, one or the other, and neither are good. So they'll carry them, like this gentleman here. Ah, sorry, the wheel is very touchy. Mm, do it this way. We're right here, tucked under their arm. This is where we get the tricorn hat from. The idea is that the, as they wore these round hats, round brimmed hats tucked up under their arm, it would kind of scrunch the sides down into this sort of point at the front. Uh, and you can see that in many, many images from this era. Hats are not worn, they are carried. You still gotta have a hat, you just can't wear it. So eventually they start to realize that this is sort of actually a trend in hats. Um, the wigs have gotten small enough, the curls are on the side, binding up a lot of that extra hair. You can start wearing your hat again, and a lot of guys are gonna put them back on, except now they're all folded up. Hatters will eventually start just making them that way, and the tricorn head as we know it is born. It's gonna stay pretty much the same throughout the 18th century, exceptions that it's gonna get a little smaller, and it's also, sometimes you'll see it with a more open front. There'll be a little bit of decoration on it, like ribbon and stuff around the edges, or a big old cockade, especially popular among French revolutionaries. The bicorn hat makes a brief appearance at the end of the century and carries into the next, and then it dies the appropriate death that it should. <laughs> also popular among French revolutionaries, there's that big cockade that I was talking about, the red, white, and blue stripes. Uh, he's not real proud of America, he's real proud of revolutionary France. Um, on to neckwear. We'll come back to these guys. Um, <laughs> So the idea of the modern tie, the cravat, all of those things, all pretty much stems from uh, these guys here. This is obviously a reenactor dressed up as a Croatian mercenary uh, from the mid 17th century. 
Um, the French enlisted these guys to help them fight whatever war it was they were fighting at the time. And as they march into Paris, the very fashionable French saw these scarves tied around their necks, and they absolutely had to have them. It becomes an immediate fad in uh, Parisian fashion, and then spreads to the rest of France and into England. Um, they fairly rapidly are going to start changing. People are going to get the idea. They're going to fuss with them. This is something that affects both upper class and lower class alike. The main difference, again, it's not what you're wearing. It's how nice it is. Um, the upper class are going to have more things like lace and that sort of a style to it. Lower class is more likely to be just a linen, um, basically a rag. Again, back to the early part of the century, big old wig still. Very quickly though, into the century, we get the stock, which is, well, it's this. It's, um, it wraps around the neck in either buttons or buckles and is usually paired up with um, a cravat. And by the way, this is where, sorry, where the cravat was born was off of those Croatian mercenaries. Um, the stock also comes in around this time. Often they're gonna be paired, and we'll see that a little later. Uh, this gentleman here is wearing a neck stock. That's the white portion around his neck. He's wearing a solitaire, as we discussed earlier, with the tie to the wig. And then the ruffles on the front there are not part of his neckwear. That's a, those are actually just sewn to the front of the shirt to help close up that uh, slash front that we were showing earlier. Uh, this is more the style I was referring to with the stock and the, um, uh, and the cravat, uh, sometimes with or without the, the stock. Not always necessary, depending on how well you wrap it around. Uh, the really wide, loose lapels and really big collars back here are typical of kind of late 18th century French. So there are a lot of different ways to style it. I could be here all day talking to you about the different ways you can tie your cravat over the, these two centuries. I'll show you a couple of pictures and we'll move on. <laughs> uh, and the question, did they really wear all that stuff? Yes, they did. Um, our modern notion of, I mean, most of you will look at me today and say, oh, he's dressed up. And I am, because this is dressed up for this time. Uh, wearing a jacket and a tie and a shirt and all of these things are considered kind of a more dressed up look. They were just clothes throughout this and the next century. Um, the, the idea of, a, a, oh, he's got on a vest and a coat, that's very fancy. It wasn't. Those were just your clothes. Um, so even gentlemen like this one here, he's a sailor, so he's going to be doing hard work. He's going to be, you know, getting wet, uh, loading and unloading boxes, sailing, all of those kinds of things. He's still wearing a waistcoat. You'll notice it's shorter than the ones that are more popular among the aristocracy, right? It's almost hip length. He's wearing a shorter coat, but he is still wearing a coat, and he will probably be working in that coat. He's even got on his cravat uh, and his tricorn hat, which are typically actually not worn forward. They're typically cocked over one of the eyes. Uh, he's wearing something also kind of unique to sailors, which is called slops or sailor slops. Uh, probably where the word sloppy comes from. They are a very loose-fitting trouser that comes down mid-calf. Uh, and are a little bit easier to work and move in. But even he is still wearing these nice kind of buckled shoes and all of that and has a nice flowy shirt. And if you don't believe me, here's more people. Um, we'll look closely. These guys are wrecking up a steamship. I'm sure there's a story behind it, but I'm more interested in their fashion today. Again, we've got the short coats on. Uh, this guy's wearing a waistcoat. This looks like his shirt to me right here, probably kind of loose and ruffly. But otherwise, he's still wearing, um, the rest of these gentlemen are also all wearing coats they're wearing their breeches, they're wearing their stockings, they're wearing their shoes. Some of them, I think this guy is even wearing a wig. Over on the other side of the image, this gentleman is still very nicely dressed. We've got a fairly long coat here. They're all dressed. These are just their clothes. These aren't their dressy clothes, they're just their clothes. All right, look at that. We're into the 20th, or into the 19th century. Moving on. Back to undergarments. That was easy. No, that's not true. There's a little more to their undergarments. Um, the collar is going to come up on shirts. Still, a lot of them have the slash front. This one actually has got a couple of buttons on it for modesty's sake, apparently. But otherwise, the shirt looks the same. Um, later in the century, you're going to see uh, the development of the placket and the fall down collar. But again, still pretty much the same. And you do see the loss of the ruffles entirely by now. And they're going to be replaced with a pleated front shirt uh, for a slightly dressier occasions. Notice, again, still they got those buttons way back here on the cuff. They're not up here like they are modern days. They are way back there. Shirts do get a little more interesting as we go into the period. Before this, they were typically plain, either, um, either bleached or unbleached cotton or linen, as we discussed. These ones, boom, you get colors, you get patterns. It's the 19th century. It's a colorful time. Um, so he's got these big old polka dots. Uh, this gentleman is actually from the Civil War. Um, 
This guy's clearly some sort of workman or another, but he still has on a very nicely patterned shirt with contrasting cuffs and collar. So he's got the white um, cuffs and collar. This guy here is apparently a locksmith. <laughs> so it says, it's also the age of slightly awkward photographs. Nobody's really worked out how you take a picture yet. So some of the pictures are kind of goofy. Um, so here he is posing with his tools. Uh, but again, you got this nice kind of stripe and check pattern shirt, along with just a big old hat. Um, these guys have the big old pockets are starting to show up here too, along with some tape that'll go around the placket occasionally. He's wearing, um, you notice he has very little collar on this shirt. It's because that shirt is designed to have a detachable collar, which we'll get to a little later. Yeah, they're still wearing that. Moving on. Um, this is more typically what we call the Regency look. This is what's popular during this time among the, the better dressed gentlemen. It's gotten much simpler and less elaborately decorated than the previous century. Um, and we have a, a gentleman named Bo, uh, Bo Brummel to thank for that. We'll get to him in just a moment, but you'll see again, we have the strongly cutaway coat, the kind of the chopped off look there. We're actually gonna get full trousers finally. Yes, no more breeches. Um, you may wear them either tucked into boots or just over your shoes. Um, I really like one thing about this era in particularly, which is the very high collars on the coats. It gives a really kind of a sharp look and you mix that with uh, the nice big bow up front and it is a pretty attractive look. There is still some little hint of the cuffs, but they're mostly gone by now. Uh, they're kind of there as a nod, but not a functional cuff by any means. And again, you see the full length trousers. Um, this one really shows how high and open the collars were becoming on the coats. But again, it's still very strongly cut away. You can see the tail poking out back down here. And he's got a nice colorful vest on underneath. This one I really like because it's probably the most what I think of as the most attractive of them, and it is almost like the uniform of this time. This is like, when you think of Regency, this is pretty much what comes up. It's this dark blue coat, contrasting nice bright, either white or cream colored pants, the tall riding boots, uh, colorful vest and the cravat uh, that's white with a white shirt. And for that, we have a gentleman to thank a little later. Um, which, yeah, we'll come back to him. He's got the nice floppy trousers, which are becoming a thing also. I wish they weren't. Um, Vests start looking more like vests. They definitely don't have sleeves and there's no buttons or buttonholes along here. They don't button all the way up to your neck anymore because nobody's wearing them that way. They're worn open on the front and um, with, if you still have your, your bow and things like that, I'll be poking through. Um, this I thought was just an interesting look. He's actually got these buttons back here to close up that vent. I am quite certain they were never buttoned. It would be wildly impractical to try to button and unbutton something behind you. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> this guy. He's the one we have to thank for pretty much the way the beginning of the 19th century fashion works. His name is Beau Brummel. Uh, and he was a, yes, we've heard the name in songs and things like that. There, it's around. Um, most people are probably not very familiar with him though more specifically. He was born into an upper middle, like upper, upper middle class family. So he has wealth, but not a tremendous amount of it. He can afford to dress well, but not as opulently or as ornately as the ultra wealthy elites are going to. That being said, he's still gonna move in those circles. He enlists in the army at a relatively young age. He serves in a fairly elite unit where he meets the current Prince of England at the time. They become fast friends and that is his gateway into um, English society. He's gonna be there as kind of the, uh, <laughs> the poor buddy for the prince. Um, so he can't afford to wear all the fancy gilt and all of those things that other guys are still wearing at this time uh, in the upper class circles. What he can afford to do is wear simple clothing that is cut perfectly. It's tasteful, it's very well tailored, um, and that's gonna become his signature look. It's gonna be typically either black or dark blue jacket on top, light contrasting fabric, pants down below. Um, and this is gonna contrast with these guys. Um, if you've heard the word fop before and the word dandy before, this is where we separate the two. They are very different. They're actually totally opposed, although they're occasionally used interchangeably. They shouldn't be. The gentleman on the left is a dandy. Carefully dressed, somewhat somberly, but excellent tailoring, very good taste. The guy on the right is a fop. It has none of those things. <laughs> um, bright colors, uh, ornate patterns, just over the top in every sense of the word. Um, this is actually another image that we're gonna come back to these guys a little later. Um, now, as far as evening wear goes, 
he also is going to set the trend for basically what we still wear more or less for very formal wear today. Um, when it comes to evening wear, you wouldn't be caught dead wearing the things that you were wearing during the day. You have to dress a little differently. Usually that meant, remember, over the top, right? He's going to take it a different direction. He's going to go keep that slick, clean look going with black trousers, black jacket, white shirt, white vest, white um, cravat. And if that sounds familiar, it's basically the birth of the tuxedo. Um, that's this guy here. We have him to thank for it. Um, because I was told I need to put lots of pictures in this, I'm showing more pictures. <laughs> um, there's a variety of different styles of, that you might have been rocking in that century. You get the top hat, the tall riding boots. You do still see that horrible belly coat um, worn with or without. Uh, the, the breeches are still in, especially when the slightly more conservative dressers. The dreadful bicorn hat is around, of course. And if you want to see how I would have dressed, it's this guy right here. None of that horrible belly coat nonsense. Just a nice tall collar, buttons to the waist, vest is not as long as the coat. It's lovely. Riding boots, good look. Okay. Ah, the Victorian. See, and I knew you were all going to make that sound. That's why I titled it this way. <laughs> there are two major looks during the Victorian. This is about 1830s up through technically the very early 1900s, although these ends look, again, fairly different. Two looks. One, the gentleman on the left. These guys are definitely dressed a little bit on the nicer side, probably still not quite going over into some fancy evening wear, but they are very well dressed. Um, Double-breasted or single-breasted frock coats are finally going to take the stage. They've been around <coughs> throughout the uh, 1700s and into the 1800s. They're not the height of fashion, but they're acceptable fashion. Um, now they are what you wear. They've replaced the just decor entirely. They've replaced the tailcoat. This is what men are wearing, especially for more day dress. Um, Vests underneath, commonly made out of silk if you can afford it, if not wool. The um, frock coat is almost exclusively wool. There probably are guys who still wore silk ones, but wool is the way to go. Um, and if you're well off, it's very, very well made wool, which has a very hard, shiny finish to it. Um, you've still got the high collars, and they are wearing either a bow tie, in this case of a gentleman over here, or this guy over here who is still wearing kind of a cravat style. They've gotten a lot slimmer, though. They're not the giant. Shh. They're not the giant bows before, they are now a little bit more slender. Or, you're the other guy. The other guy is wearing what's called a sack coat. You can guess why. Uh, it's a very blousy, baggy coat, easy to move in, easy to work in, becomes the favored uniform actually of um, the federal soldiers during the Civil War. Uh, they're, they're, they have a, a, it's called a fatigue blouse, it's effectively the same style coat. Uh, and that becomes their preferred wear. Um, still going to wear a vest, still going to wear a tie, still going to wear trousers, except now the fly is on the front. Good news. Moving into the time we recognize. And watch chains are becoming quite in vogue, even among the not quite as wealthy. Wow. And then there's also that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> It's an age of mixing and matching your patterns. Um, so a lot of people will look at modern fashion today and you'll see the same thing, although I would argue it's more tastefully done now, hopefully, maybe not. Um, big bold plaids, uh, especially on trousers, are very common during this time. Uh, you're also gonna see things like brocades still in vests uh, and things like this guy's wearing polka dots. Notice though, he's also uh, wearing oops, still his frock coat. Um, which at this time, by the time we get to kind of mid-19th century, is going to have a very large sleeve. It's this giant kind of D-shaped sleeve. Um, and that's going to be fairly popular for a couple of decades, and then it kind of disappears and goes back to the real slim look. Um, so a couple of guys here. One of the things I really like in this image is uh, these guys are probably both not quite as well off um, as some of the other folks we've looked at today. Part of the reason I know that is looking at the gentleman on the left here, Notice how far over he has his coat buttoned. He's trying to get that nice, clean, fitted look that is popular among frock coats, but he probably can't afford a tailor. So what he's done is he's probably had his mother move the button <laughs> over a few inches on his coat so that it buttons further over and thus fits more tightly. They'll still do that on uh, tailoring today. If you need to have something taken in like this much, they'll just move the button over usually. Um, during this time, though, you see it very commonly, especially among young men. Um, well, moms buy clothes big because you're going to grow into them, right? 
and they button way over to here. I've seen some where the, the edge of the coat is like way over here. It's, it's way under the side. Um, we are getting into an age of slightly large bow ties. Um, some of them are sort of tastefully large, if that's a word. Some of them are literally over a foot wide. They're, they're quite enormous, and I've got some pictures of them later. Round hats are coming into vogue, um, as well as the top hat is, um, carries on from earlier in the century, and it's actually gonna go all the way to the end and into the next century, too. Um, another style of hat, um, we've got this young man's wearing what's called a wheel cap. It's kind of a neat look. Definitely have to have just the right, oops, rest right face to pull that off, uh, but it has a really big round floppy top to it and a, uh, kind of a brim on the front and usually a, a strap. The chin strap, it's probably not functional. Um, and he's, of course, being semi-scandalous and walking around with his vest unbuttoned. <laughs> uh, we also get sweaters, which is fun, something we don't often think about, or at least I hadn't thought about. Um, was sweaters, and when they kind of start to show up, they're surprisingly late in history. They're, they're kind of in and out throughout history as I've been able to trace it. Uh, this is basically exactly what all, every sweater looks like during the Victorian era. They're dark on, you know, kind of dark body with this sort of white or, or very light colored, contrasting light colored uh, yarns for the front, but they are knit. Uh, he's also wearing tall boots. They're not quite riding boots. These are tall work boots. These, you know, this guy obviously does labor and things like that. I really like this guy, it's a good shot. Um, this is basically going to be the look for, call it 1870s all the way well into the early 1900s. Um, the main change is that you're gonna see is that the fabric is gonna get just a little finer. Um, you'll notice like the coat I'm wearing today does not look like that real thick, heavy wool um, that we've been seeing in some of the other images. That's the transition we're gonna see as it starts right kind of at the end of the 18th century. Um, he's also wearing, you got the notch lapels, very typical of a modern suit. He's got his pocket square, uh, and he's wearing what's called a, a foreign hand necktie. What a new and strange idea. Um, this officially starts probably right around 1850s, 1860s. Doesn't become popular until a little later. Uh, there is a gentleman's club in London called the Foreign Hand Club, and they kind of pioneer this new way of tying your necktie. Um, which is, looks very familiar if it does, does it not. Um, and that's going to be pretty much the look that takes over. And you start to see the cravats and things disappear. Guys like this one, it's simple, it's easy. You just knock it out, you stick it down your vest and you're out the door. There are no more elaborately tied bow ties or any of that nonsense. Um, it is still an age of absolutely immaculate tailoring. Um, anybody who knows their tailoring, there's not a wrinkle across his back. It's perfect. Um, there, I, it looks like there's not even a seam here, which is surprising. It might just not show up very well in the picture. Um, but you get the, still a nice tailcoat falling very evenly. Um, it's the look. If you're a well-tailored um, gentleman, you are in good shape. Also popular, Oscar Wilde, by the way, um, is the smoking jacket. This is a casual jacket worn around the home, and it's something you're going to wear. Again, you can be receiving guests and things wearing that. Um, you wouldn't go out and just your, your vest necessarily and entertain guests. That's not the look. You'd put on a jacket of some sort. Either it's going to be a house coat like a, or like a banyan like we saw earlier, or it's going to be a smoking jacket, which is far more common in this time. You're still going to have something on. Now, the discrepancy between upper class and the lower class, the look is still very similar. Like I said, it's, it's mostly you're going to just try to, as closely as possible, um, look like the wealthy on a budget. Um, and this is another, did they really wear all that? Yes. This is clearly a working man's outfit. Uh, no self-respecting wealthy person ever would have let their coat get to this level. He's got holes in his pants. This is an everyman, but he's still wearing a vest, a coat, and a fairly decorative cravat and a hat. The bowler comes into popularity around this time. Um, guys on the left here are French, so they're a little bit fancier dressed still. The French are gonna keep on. Some of those fashions are a little more over the top for a while yet. Um, but even these gentlemen are showing off an interesting point. This guy is carrying a riding crop. He's going riding in all of that, <laughs> top hat included. This gentleman has a musket on his shoulder. That's a shot bag and that's for powder. He's going hunting in that. These are not dressy clothes. These are just clothes. These are what you wear. They may look nice, but they're still just what you wear. Also, these guys are showing off nicely what's called the pigeon-breasted look. Very popular at the height of the Victorian is actually to put padding inside your coat. Um, this is what it looks like inside of a coat without uh, any of the lining yet in. 
this large portion here is co um, either cotton or more likely wool batting, like you'd find inside of a quilt, and it's meant to puff up your upper chest. Finally, we're looking at guys' chests now. Um, and, there's a, and this is uh, probably a horsehair canvas underneath that's gonna give body to the, uh, the coat so that it's not quite so loose and floppy looking. It's gonna look smooth and stiff. Um, but you're gonna have all this padding here to give you that fluffy chest. And yes, it's extremely hot. It's like wearing a quilt. A uh, couple of little kind of nods to more, some more neckwear while we're looking at it, because um, again, why not show historical figures we recognize? Uh, here's an early image of not yet President Lincoln wearing that just real large bow tie that's common. This guy here is rocking a very nicely tied kind of foreign hand style uh, necktie and frock coat. Also, the tag on this, by the way, that I saw was my Victorian boyfriend. I thought it was funny. <laughs> Uh, in terms of footwear, you got a few choices. You can still wear tall riding boots, those are popular. The work boots we saw earlier, or these guys here are what we call the Jefferson Brogan or Jefferson Booty, made popular by President, uh, very recently President Jefferson at the time, uh, during his inaugural address. He wore shoes with laces, weird. Um, but this is the style. Under, on the underside, they have a very kind of uh, strongly shaped sole, and they're held together with wooden pegs uh, often, or sometimes they're sewn. You often find uh, nails set into the heel. This is common of all the footwear of the time. Does two things. One, it holds the whole thing together. Two, when you're walking on gravel and hard surfaces wearing leather and wood soles, what is going to happen to your heel? It's gonna wear away. Nails, or later you'll also see heel plates, which look like a little horseshoe on the bottom of your foot, are gonna help keep your shoe from wearing down. Uh, the other option is the button boot. Yeah, so not, not spats, but they're reminiscent of spats. I'm glad you said that. It reminded me that I have to mention that. These are called button boots. Now, um, we mentioned spats because spats are, have a very similar look, except this here is a separate piece. It fits over your shoe. It's going to help keep your stockings um, from getting quite so muddy. It's going to protect them just from some of the weather. And also, it's going to keep rocks and things out of your shoe, because back then, shoes were cut quite low. Um, the button boot kind of just bastardizes the process and puts them together. Um, this is common, uh, starts um, commonly among women, and men quickly adopt the same style. The other option is what's called a Congress boot or a Congress shoe. Um, kind of early prototype style elastic sides here, uh, not obviously elastic, but a, sort of a, a, a stretchy fabric, uh, and it comes up to kind of mid ankle. These are still popular, you can still buy them. I have a pair. Oops. Um, one other thing that starts to show up <clears throat> late Victorian era is what's called uh, the morning coat and morning dress. It is a formal day wear. So if you're going to go to the races or something like that or a day wedding and you need to be dressed formally, but during the day, because you wouldn't wear a tuxedo and during the day, that would be just ridiculous. It's before six o'clock. Why would you do that? You would wear morning dress and you would not wear morning dress in the evening because again, what are you doing? Um, so this is meant as, actually originally they were kind of a riding style coat and later become more popular and acceptable as formal day wear. Um, still worn in certain circles, especially popular in London society still, you will still see people wearing these for things like weddings. It's sort of the, here we'll wear a tuxedo for a wedding sometimes. Often, instead of a tuxedo, men will wear a morning coat um, because again, it's during the daytime and what are you doing if you're wearing a tuxedo before six? <coughs> Complete with top hat. Uh, vest, and you'll also see the bottom there, it has striped uh, gray trousers. It's very common for this. Also popular though is the tuxedo uh, for the evening wear. It's going to be a uh, black jacket, black trousers, white vest, sometimes black vest if you're feeling adventurous, uh, white shirt, and um, you'll get a black tie with that. And when you get to white tie, looks real similar except, you guessed it, you have a white tie. And if you want to dress it up a little bit, you can put a little flower or whatever. Uh, gloves are also typical of white tie. We don't see white tie very much anymore. The standards for it are still basically the same, which tells you how little it gets used anymore. Uh, so we mentioned detachable collars. They really come to prominence by the time we get into the early 20th century. Um, they're invented kind of actually fairly early 1800s. Uh, basically, a woman realizes that, hey, I've been having to wash this guy's shirts all the time. The collars are always ruined. Her, her husband was a blacksmith, so his collars are constantly covered in soot and ruined. It's the only part of the shirt you get to see anyway. Why am I washing this whole dang shirt? 
So she cut the collars off, washed them, sewed them back on in a way that would be easy to reattach, and thus the collar is born. Um, becomes a little more popular as the centuries wear on, uh, but the idea is very simple, that you have a very kind of low band instead of a collar, and they literally just button in place. They're typically made out of a heavily starched fabric uh, and are quite replaceable and fairly uncomfortable, I hear. Uh, held in place in the back with a button, which you can't really see them very well, but there's little slits back here and a stud in the front, which is a pretty dressy look and I like it. This gentleman is showing a very high collar and is actually not me. <laughs> I know. I was pretty wigged out to see it too. Yeah, paper collars are, some, are sometimes called got very high, uh, and then again, people went, ah, oh, that's just ridiculous, and stopped doing it. <sighs> End of the 20s. Uh, so 20s, boom, World War I is over. Any of the fabric rationing that may have been going on is over. It's the age of the big suit. Trousers are large. They've got this nice prominent crease down the front. You'll notice we did not see creases on trousers earlier on. The machinery didn't exist to do it properly, and the wool is a very heavyweight wool. It wouldn't have held a crease well anyway. Um, now that the wool is getting finer, we have some more industrialization in our clothing. Boom, big crease. Also popular is the uh, cuff on the bottom. Very kind of large, loosely fitting jacket, still tailored nicely up around the arm though, you'll notice. Very wide lapels, and of course, fedora on top, right? And if you're not wearing a, ne a necktie, what are you even doing? Um, Pocket square is also popular. Double-breasted or single-breasted, both acceptable. This look is gonna hold us through the 30s and 40s. Uh, there is some subtle changes. The big thing is actually when you hit World War II, fabric rationing starts and government says, no more flaps on your pockets, no more cuffs on your trousers, no more pleats on your trousers, because uh, pleated trousers are also popular. Um, they're trying to minimize fabric use, although admittedly, very minimally. Um, so it became fashionable throughout the 40s to be wearing your 20s and 30s styled suits to show how patriotic you were that you are not only not, you know, buying jackets with uh, flaps on your pockets, you're not even buying a new coat at all, that's how patriotic you are not buying new things and you're saving so much more fabric that way. So this look is going to hold us pretty clear through the 40s. Um, Young men are still going to be, especially lower class young men, are still going to be dressing a little bit more like the previous era. The newsboy cap becomes very popular through the 20s and 30s also. And then, of course, the age of the very high waist and the wide tie is going to start rolling in. That'll carry us through into the 50s and into the early 60s very commonly. You'll notice, though, the pleats did not come back. They will come back around eventually, uh, especially in the 80s and things like that. You'll see the pleats start to show up again. But kind of through the late 40s and 50s, even after the fabric rationing stops, they don't put the pleats back on because they know what good fashion looks like. Uh, <laughs> cuffs do come back though. All right, so that, uh, and that takes us kind of another, just kind of a side note to the men's fashion of the time. It's also the rise of the sort of Ivy League look and the rise of the prep look, uh, sort of early days of that. So these guys are not only not wearing a tie, they're not even wearing a proper shirt, they're wearing what's called the polo shirt. Uh, these days, although historically the polo shirt was actually a, uh, it's a regular dress shirt that buttoned down on the collar, similar to, the, where's my, there we go, similar to the buttons I have on my collars now, which we've seen all around a lot. Um, the reason was when you were riding your horse playing polo and you've got a big floppy collar, it's flopping all over the place. So they started buttoning their collars down just as a, you know, make things easier. Well, uh, John Brooks of Brooks Brothers saw it, thought it was kind of a sharp look, started putting it in the stores and then everybody had them. Um, so, yeah, these are more like a kind of like a golf shirt. Uh, the polo shirt is technically the button down, but we sort of switched around the meanings of things so much over the years. Um, so that's the look that they're going for. And of course, they're wearing a jacket over the top. Uh, these guys on the left are probably not going golfing. These guys with these horrible pants probably are. <laughs> Just a little closing notes on some things I observed um, doing the research for this. Um, Yes, these are both young gentlemen. Um, I know. So we're seeing pink and we're seeing dresses, neither of which are things we typically associate with men. And the reason that these are acceptable in this context is that they are acceptable during that time, and they're not anymore. 
Pink was, uh, for the longest time, considered actually a fairly masculine color. It's a derivative of red, and of course, we think, you know, you know, the Romans wore red, and it's, you know, blood and battle and all of those things. Red's a manly color. You know, red power ties, that's the look, right? Well, pink is red adjacent. It was considered a masculine color. Blue was considered more dainty and delicate, actually, and so blue was acceptable for girls, and pink was popular among boys. And this was the case for quite a while. Uh, it's not actually until right around the kind of 1940s that manufacturers actually start switching that up and they kind of reverse the two. And I think the reason was that everybody had to go out and buy new baby clothes for that reason. <laughs> um, it's more of an industrial time and people are easy to spend money and I think they just capitalized on that. So the two have switched. Um, but pink was originally masculine. It went kind of gender neutral for a while back to masculine and then became more entirely effeminate now. Although you are now seeing men who will comfortably wear pink shirts. I have a couple of pink shirts. Uh, yeah, it's coming around again. Real men wear pink. Yeah, it's a whole movement, right? It's a hashtag and all that stuff. Um, I'm not like super fond of it as a color personally, which is why I don't wear it, not because it's effeminate, but I do have a pink shirt or two. Um, on the right, we've got a young gentleman wearing a dress. As I mentioned earlier in the kind of early 1700s image, uh, dresses are very common among young children of both genders, and it's just super easy to change a diaper that way. That's the reason. Um, <laughs> the idea of the dress as a woman's thing showed up much later. I couldn't quite track down when they stopped doing that, but it's, again, fairly recent. Um, and you notice, though, even that this coat is reminiscent of the Justicor with the big cuffed back sleeves and the buttons down the front and kind of the look of a flared front. Okay, and uh, a squirrel for no particular reason. <laughs> There's a couple hundred years of painting that just has weird stuff in it. It's like the awkward photos during the Victorian times. Yeah. Yep. Some of my favorite Victorian images are a couple of guys like posing together. They both have like a pipe in each other's mouths, like their arms are linked. So there's like weird stuff. I don't... <laughs> All right, we're going to close up with my favorite fashion flops that I discovered through this era. Um, I promise we talk about this. We're coming back to it. This. Yeah, what is that? This is macaroni. As in, he stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. It has nothing to do with sticking noodles in your hat. Um, Macaroni is a fashion movement and it's kind of a pseudo-cultural movement, um, reminiscent of kind of the mid-1700s mostly, but even into the late 1700s, where young, usually wealthy men would go and travel the European continent and absorb all that culture, um, which means they went to France and they went to Italy, where they discovered a taste for macaroni. So they came back and they talked at length about how delicious macaroni is and all that stuff and also began referring to anything very fashion forward, um, to borrow a modern fashion term, as well, that's very macaroni. As in it's sort of European and, you know, yeah, I know. But the current generation says on fleek, which what does that mean? So, I mean, the, there's always something. Uh, so what is all this? So the fashion that they brought back resulted in this ridiculously over the top. Just whatever was going on, it is to the manyth degree more. And you get these oops, enormous wigs, um, just utterly enormous wigs. These are caricatures, so they're probably a little overdone for effect. Um, I've seen a few that are probably about half that size, but that's still an enormous wig. Um, the joke was that you couldn't even put on your own hat. You needed to use either like the tip of a sword or a cane to put your hat on. <coughs> My guess, they probably didn't actually wear the hat with this look. They probably just carried it like before. Um, but everything is just ridiculous. Giant bow ties and all of that kind of look. Um, often considered very effeminate. It starts off as... Um, those of you who are familiar, you might even compare it to kind of the hipster sort of a style, sort of dramatically meant to make you go, that's kind of weird. And then, as all fashion does, it builds and builds and builds until it hits a point when everyone goes, oh, that's just ridiculous. And then it disappears, which it does happen at this time also. Um, you'll compare that also with uh, the French, who kind of late, very late in the 18th century, develop uh, this look. Uh, these folks are called the incroyable, and they are young, disenfranchised, uh, usually men at this time. There's a female variant also, and it's really French, and I can't pronounce it. Um, 
but they, it, it's the end of the reign of terror and their response to all of the just gloom and doom of that time was to instead come out and sort of with this loud and bright colors and again everything way over the top and enormous. If it's supposed to be small, it's enormous. If it's supposed to be large, it's tiny. Uh, just deliberately counterculture um, looks. Um, they're also going to affect a bunch of strange mannerisms. They're going to walk with a hunch, and some of them speak with a lisp, and there's all sorts of other odd things. Their kids acting out is basically, I think, what it is at this point, mostly. Um, and partially, it's also meant to mock the aristocracy of the time, uh, sort of adopting their, their fashion and then overdoing it to make them look silly by comparison also. Yeah, remember how I told you the ties got really big during the Victorian? <laughs> it's not a good look for him either. He's not even like pulling it off, it's just... Also, the enormous top hats are another trend that they sort of hit that point and then stopped and they came back down to a reasonable size. He's also got just a ridiculously large amount of cravat tucked down his shirt here, which he may not even be wearing a shirt, you can't see it. Um, he is, you can see the collar. Um, Yep, more Victorians. Yep, yep, that's some bold pattern there is what that is. But of course, I have to finish it off with... <laughs> 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 Get rid of that. 